John's in trouble. With only the instrument time from his private training, he's gone too far into this marginal weather. Unfortunately, he's not aware of the seriousness of the situation. Boy, they sure blew this forecast. That five miles visibility they talked about looks more like two. John is having a hard time judging the visibility. And he's unsure about the height of the overcast and his height above the ground. This doesn't look right. Wonder where those towers are. John's off course. How far? He really doesn't know. And what about the towers out there? He's not sure where they are either. No problem. I've flown in worse weather than this. Besides, no guts, no glory. Subconsciously, John is easing back on the controls to make sure he clears the towers that he knows are out there somewhere. Suddenly, he's IFR. There's a funny feeling in his stomach. John, what are you doing here? This trip's not that important. Even though John feels like he's flying straight and level, the instruments say otherwise. Why is the heading indicator turning? A little aileron in order here. No, no, that's not right. There, that feels better. These instruments don't make sense. Hope I break out soon. There's something wrong with the controls. Most weather-related accidents are not the result of a single event, but can be attributed to a series of poor decisions. This is why it's so important to continue your weather decision-making process throughout the entire flight. Each flight involves a continuous series of weather-related decisions. How well you analyze and react to the chain of events of a flight can determine whether the flight is safe and successful or results in tragedy. Several factors are involved with each decision you make. One of the most important is an analysis of yourself. Are you mentally prepared and physically capable of conducting the flight safely? The aircraft also plays a significant role in weather-related decisions. Is it airworthy and equipped to handle the existing and forecast weather? Will it perform under the existing conditions? The type of operation you're conducting influences your weather decision-making process. How critical is the flight? Do you have an alternate plan in case of bad weather? Do you have enough fuel to carry out the alternate plan with adequate reserve? The environment you're operating in also plays a significant role in weather decision-making. Is the weather improving or deteriorating? Are there escape routes available if it deteriorates? Keep in mind that this process of evaluation does not end with the pre-flight go decision. It's a continual process throughout the entire flight. And you have a wide variety of resources available to help you gather in-flight weather information. To demonstrate this point, let's follow two pilots and see how they evaluate in-flight weather. This is Sandy Johnson. She's been visiting friends in Denver and needs to be home in time to see her daughter's first school recital this evening. Her flight today will take her from Front Range Airport, just east, to Wiley Post near Oklahoma City. Sandy's decision to make this flight was based on her analysis of the standard weather briefing she received this morning. From that briefing, she learned that the current weather is VFR for the first portion of her flight and lowers to IFR toward her destination. The forecast calls for a clearing trend from the west. If all goes well, 
the weather should be above her personal weather minimums as the flight progresses eastward. But there is a possibility of afternoon thunderstorms with heavy rain showers. Sandy plans to watch the weather closely and keep as many options available as possible. Denver, Denver Front Range Airport. Automated Before takeoff, Sandy listens to the Front Range Automated Weather Observing System, commonly called AWOS. The AWOS-3 Sandy is listening to provides the altimeter setting, wind information including peak gusts, temperature, dew point, density altitude, visibility, and cloud and ceiling data below 12,000 feet. AWOS provides four levels of service. They transmit over discrete frequencies or nav aids and provide a variety of real-time weather data to pilots on the ground and in flight. Most are also available by telephone. AWOS-A provides the altimeter setting. AWOS-1 adds wind data, temperature, dew point, and density altitude. AWOS-2 adds visibility. And AWOS-3 adds cloud and ceiling information. ASOS, which stands for Automated Surface Observing System, is a new service that will provide extensive weather data through selected VHF and VOR frequencies, as well as the telephone. Details about AWOS and ASOS can be found in the airport facility directory and other appropriate aeronautical publications. The frequencies also appear on instrument approach charts. Once Sandy is safely airborne and heading toward her first checkpoint, she contacts Denver Radio to open her flight plan. Denver Radio, Cessna 62740, listening on 122.2. Cessna 740, Denver Radio, go ahead. Denver Radio, Cessna 740, I'd like to open my flight plan from Front Range to Wiley Post at eight minutes after the hour. Sandy let the flight service station know she was using the simplex frequency 122.2 for her communications. This allowed the in-flight briefer to select the specific frequency to talk to Sandy without tying up all of the available frequencies. I'd like to get an update on the weather from Gage to Wiley Post. In addition to opening and closing flight plans, flight service station briefers can provide standard, abbreviated and outlook weather briefings, as well as random reports and forecasts. This is also the facility to contact to give VFR position reports. Gage is reporting 1,500 scattered, 2,500 broken, visibility 8 miles, wind... Sandy's updated weather information shows the improving trend continues, but not as quickly as she had hoped. Sandy reaffirms the personal weather minimum she set before the flight a 2,000-foot ceiling, and five miles visibility. She'll have to keep a close eye on the weather ahead. Just past the Lamar Vortac, Sandy begins to notice a change in the weather. Those clouds sure look ominous. I wonder if there are any pilot reports on the weather ahead. Denver Flight Watch, Cessna 62740. Lamar Vortec, over. November 740, Denver Flight Watch, go ahead. Sandy contacts en route flight advisory service by stating Denver the name Flight of the parent Denver facility Denver followed by the words like Flight Watch, then giving her aircraft identification and the name of the nearest VOR. If Sandy didn't know the name of the flight service station, she would have simply stated Flight Watch, followed by her aircraft identification. Giving the name of the nearest VOR allows the flight watch specialist to select the most appropriate outlet to communicate with Sandy. The people who work the flight watch position are specially trained weather briefers. The service is available from 0600 until 2200 local time and is operational between 5,000 feet AGL and 18,000 feet MSL. In some parts of the country, high altitude flight watch is available above 18,000 feet through flight service stations. Flight watch is designed to provide weather reports and forecasts 
related to the en route portion of the flight. It isn't available for handling flight plans or pre-flight weather briefings. A Cessna 421 departing gauge at 10 past the hour. Reported the cloud base is at 4,500 MSL. Let's see. Uh, King Air on approach at Garden City. Flight Watch is also the central collection and distribution point for like pilot reported weather. Forecast. Gauge hasn't improved much in the last hour, and there's been little or no improvement further east. Over. Sandy is careful to give accurate information in her pilot report, since she knows other pilots may depend on the information she supplies. Sandy is becoming concerned that the weather is not improving as forecast. She's been able to maintain her personal weather minimum so far, but it doesn't look good ahead. By evaluating her options now, she can speed up the decision-making process should a diversion become necessary. She knows the weather at Lamar is good because she just flew over it. Liberal also is an option, but she's too far away to pick up the AWOS. Gage had a pilot report that indicated the ceiling was just above her minimums. Sandy decides to continue to Liberal. If the weather is well above her minimums when she gets there, she will continue toward Gage. As she tunes in the Liberal VOR, she gets more bad news. Wichita Radio, Aviation Broadcast, Weather Advisory. Convective segment Charlie 1 is in effect. From Salina to 1-5 miles east of Gage to Lubbock. Scattered embedded thunderstorms moving northeast at 1-0 knots. A few level 4 cells, tops to 3-5,000. Flight service stations broadcast in-flight advisories over their communication outlets to notify en route pilots of the possibility of hazardous conditions which may not have been forecast at the time of the pre-flight briefing. A severe weather forecast alert, AWW, and a convective SIGMET, WST, are broadcast upon receipt and at 15-minute intervals on the hour and at 15, 30, and 45 minutes after the hour for the first hour. A SIGMET, WS, AIRMET, WA, and a center weather advisory, CWA, are broadcast upon receipt and at 15 and 45 minutes past the hour for the first hour after issuance. Following the first hour, a summarized alert notice is broadcast at 15 and 45 minutes past the hour during the valid period. Sandy knows that a convective SIGMET is issued for convective weather that's potentially hazardous to all aircraft. Since she still has some time before the bad weather becomes a factor, she decides to monitor both flight watch and the nav aids with voice capability to keep updated on the weather. As Sandy passes Liberal, she listens to the AWOS and finds the ceiling is still above her personal minimums. Liberal is a good airport to return to if the weather deteriorates ahead. Columbia Flight Watch, Cessna 62740. Liberal Vortec, over. After passing Liberal, she gives Flight Watch another call to check on the weather around Gage. The reports indicate the hazardous weather extends from just east of Gage to the Oklahoma City area. Beyond Gage, the ceiling is just below her personal weather minimums. Wiley Post is no longer an option. Sandy decides to select a suitable nearby airport and land. Since she already researched the airports in the area, she quickly decides on West Woodward Airport, just east of Gage VOR. Liberal is still her backup, just in case the weather deteriorates on her way to West Woodward. McAllister Radio, Cessna 62740, listening on 122.55. Sandy used the services available and her knowledge of weather to make logical and sound in-flight weather decisions. Sandy wisely diverted to an alternate airport rather than continuing into marginal weather. Even though her desire to get home is great, she knows that it is far better to miss this one recital 
than to press on and maybe never see another. This is Bill Dreyer. He and the vice president of marketing are flying to Denver for a very important business dinner tonight. From Bill's computer-based weather briefing this morning, he determined that the flight will be in instrument conditions most of the way. If all goes well, the weather should be above his personal weather minimums when he makes the approach at Centennial Airport, just south of Denver. His alternate is Colorado Springs, where the weather is forecast to remain well above his minimums. Bill plans to make the flight at 8,000 feet. This altitude gives him the best winds, lets him stay below the forecast 12,000-foot freezing level, and keeps him above the turbulence at 6,000 feet, which is especially important for the vice president's comfort. Once the pre-flight checks are complete, Bill departs Cedar Rapids Airport and is handed off to departure control, and then to Minneapolis Center. Bill's flight from Cedar Rapids to near Grand Island has been smooth and mostly in IFR conditions. Up to this point, it's been a fairly routine flight. The winds at 8,000 feet, however, have been better than forecast, and he's ahead of schedule. After Bill contacts Denver Center on the handoff from Minneapolis, Denver responds with, This is 111 Bravo Victor, radar contact. Maintain 8,000. Be advised, center weather advisory 02 is in effect for moderate mixed icing in the vicinity of Akron at 8 to 10,000 feet. A center weather advisory is an unscheduled broadcast issued to pilots to warn them of adverse weather conditions along their routes or in terminal areas. It is issued for conditions which are occurring now or are scheduled to begin within the next two hours. These advisories are issued once by a center facility on all frequencies, except emergency, when any part of the area described is within 150 miles of the airspace under the center's jurisdiction. Terminal facilities, however, might not report the advisory if the conditions are farther than 50 miles from their airspace. Bill knows a number of sources are available that will allow him to monitor the weather without leaving the center frequency. Hazardous in-flight weather advisory service, called HIWAS, is available over selected VORs in some parts of the country. Transcribed weather broadcasts, tweebs, are also available over selected NDBs and VORs. These are often based on commonly used routes. Information about HIWAS, tweebs, and other in-flight weather broadcasts can be found in the Airman's Information Manual and other aeronautical information publications. Another source Bill frequently uses is monitoring the en route flight advisory frequency, or flight watch. Since Bill is now facing the possibility of flying into icing in an aircraft that is not equipped to do so, he has to make a decision. He must decide whether to descend to a lower altitude where the turbulence is forecast to be greater, climb above the icing where the headwinds are forecast to be stronger, or divert to a suitable alternate. Bill requests a frequency change to the en route flight advisory service. By talking directly to Flight Watch, he can get more information on the center weather advisory and request additional information and pilot reports on the conditions at different altitudes. Bill could have asked the controller for more information, but that would have tied up the controller. Besides, if Bill has to change altitudes or divert, he wants to get as much information as possible. Could you give me more information on Center Weather Advisory 02? Let's see. Denver Center Weather Advisory 02. Numerous reports of moderate mixed icing from 8 to 10,000 feet between Hayes Center and Akron. Do you have any pie reps of icing above 10,000 and updated winds aloft over the Akron area? Bill learns that a beach baron reported no icing at 12,000 feet between Hayes Center and Akron. But the winds at higher altitudes are still strong, which means greater headwinds. 
He also learns that turbulence is still being reported by pilots flying at lower altitudes. Bill records this information so he doesn't have to rely on memory later. Based on this information, Bill decides not to go to the alternate, but he also realizes that he is not going to be able to continue at his present altitude. He doesn't really want to descend and fly in turbulence because of the discomfort it would mean to his passenger. In addition, he knows that the MEA west of Akron is 8,000 feet, so he might have to climb back through the icing to get up to the MEA. However, if he climbs above the icing, there are stronger headwinds which will increase his flight time. This might affect his fuel reserve if he has to divert or encounters any delays. Bill must also consider the possibility that once he's above the icing, he might have to descend through the conditions at his destination. The Center Weather Advisory, however, indicates that the icing is only occurring between Hayes Center and Akron, and none is reported in the Denver area. With all the factors considered, Bill decides to request 12,000 feet. If he goes higher, he will have to consider the use of oxygen. After checking back in with Center, he requests and is assigned 12,000 feet. As the flight progresses, Bill keeps close track of the fuel remaining. His decision to climb appears to have been a good one. The ride is smooth and there is no sign of icing. Bill decides to make a pilot report. It's a good practice to report good weather as well as bad. As Bill approaches the Denver area, he tunes in and listens to the ATIS at Centennial. Centennial Airport Information X-ray. 20450 weather, estimated ceiling 400 overcast, visibility 4 in light rain, temperature 48, dew point 46, wind 020 at 2. A 400 foot ceiling leaves Bill with another decision. Bill has set his personal weather minimums at the circling minimums for the approach, which in this case are 637 feet above the airport elevation and one mile visibility. With a 400-foot ceiling, Bill will still be IFR when he reaches his personal minimums. Does he go ahead and shoot the approach and hope that the weather improves to at least his personal minimums? Does he disregard his personal minimums and go down to the published minimums? Or does he immediately proceed to his alternate? Because Bill has kept track of his fuel, he knows that he has enough to shoot at least two approaches at Centennial and still be able to get to his alternate with the legal fuel reserve. Therefore, he decides to make an approach to Centennial. If Bill doesn't have the runway environment in sight at his personal weather minimums, his plan is to execute a missed approach and proceed to the alternate. When Bill reaches his personal minimums, he still does not have the runway environment in sight. Having made his plan, he resists the temptation to continue the descent to published minimums and executes a missed approach. After declaring a missed approach, Bill is handed back to approach control and requests a clearance to his alternate. At the first opportunity, Bill checks the weather at Colorado Springs. He's informed that Colorado Springs is reporting a 1,500-foot ceiling. Even though Bill did not land at his proposed destination, he and his vice president still have enough time to drive to Denver for their business dinner. And because he stuck to his personal weather minimums, he feels good about not compromising the safety of the flight. Both Sandy and Bill use the resources available to them to keep track of changing weather conditions and to make sound in-flight weather decisions. In-flight weather information is available from a wide variety of sources. Knowing how to access and obtain the weather you need is an important step toward ensuring that every flight you take is safe and enjoyable. During the 1990s, Pilots will benefit from a $2 billion Joint National Weather Service, Federal Aviation Administration, 
and Department of Defense program to modernize the nation's weather system. New Doppler weather radars located across the nation will provide more detailed information on weather hazards to flight. A network of automated surface observing systems at airports nationwide will broadcast readings of surrounding atmospheric conditions every minute. A new series of geostationary satellites will provide pilots with timely and accurate pictures of weather along flight routes. Weather information will be disseminated by an advanced data processing system capable of rapidly transmitting advisories from weather forecast offices across the United States to the aviation community. Look for further announcements of improved weather services that will be realized in the near future. <laughs>